Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to my latest video. Uh, this is something new for me. I'm actually doing an interview today of uh, Mr. Jeremy Like, who is uh, another YouTuber in the technology scope. And we're going to start talking tonight about Linux. That is our topic of discussion. Primarily, we'll cover a few other topics, but it's very important for some people to understand where Linux fits in the scheme of things. I used to be a big follower of it and used it quite a bit more than I do now. I don't think many people have anywhere near the experience that would do them well if they had it. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So who I have with me is Jeremy Like. Jeremy, you want to give your, a quick introduction about yourself? Sure. Um, uh, again, my name is Jeremy Like. I am a tech guy by training and trade. Um, I have a master's in information security. Uh, I currently work as the technology coordinator at a small library and YouTube is my main hobby. I just, uh, in the last couple of days, I passed the 1700 subscriber mark. So it's kind of a, a milestone for me. Congratulations. I meant to congratulate you on that. Thank Thanks you. for bringing it up. Thank you. My viewers uh, have probably heard piecemeal introductions about me spread throughout various videos. Let me be more formal. Um, David Rivera, uh, my day job is associated with computer security. I have credentials in computer security, just like Jeremy. I don't have my master's in that particular discipline. Mine is more generic when it comes to technology in computer science. And it's a little bit dated compared to some of the ones that are coming out of school these days. But I also have an MBA and I have my Bachelor of Technology degree in computer technology. That's how I got started with all of this. And you'll see, you know, I'm sure some of you, if you've looked at my intros or, you know, my channel headers, you would see some of that. When it comes to Linux, I, uh, I used to use it a lot going back about 20 years or so. It was actually part of my job for a while because it was a follow on to my development experience. So I think it's very important for people to understand it. I know people are afraid of the command line stuff, but these days you don't have to use that. There are much simpler ways to interface to it with good graphical user interfaces. With that, I wanted to start off by you know, getting a feel for how Jeremy uses Linux, and he uses it a lot more than I do. Correct me if I'm wrong. You are actually pretty much converted over to that as your primary operating system. Isn't that correct? I did at one point and I, I kind of jumped ship. I, I, I stuck with a Unix system and, and went to Mac OS. Uh, but uh, with the transition coming uh, from Apple on the Macs, I'm getting ready to transition back to Linux uh, at, at least for a, a few years, but uh, it, it'll be nice to come back and, you, you know, do a deeper dive and, and, you know, use it as my daily driver, as they say. Oh, okay. Do you use it at work as well? Uh, I have a few projects uh, at the library that I've kind of snuck it in. Um, you know, there are a lot of um, pieces of Linux software that can be used for things like IT um, uh, inventory management. Um, and you can just spin up a VM and there's a little agent that will install in each of the PCs and it will tell you, you know, what software is installed, if it needs patches, um, things of that nature. And it makes uh, documenting things a little bit easier. Now, most people may not realize this, but there are some things that you can do much more effectively in Linux or any real, when you mentioned Unix before, that's really not much of a departure from Linux, right? Right. They come from the same roots, as they say. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later as I get into some of the, uh, the things that I brought to show people today. It was a follow on to me. My experience, as I said before, was in, a, in Unix itself, uh, a variant of Unix created by its creators called uh, Unix Sys5 for System 5. AT&T and Bell Labs created that. And the, the guy who, uh, who originally was one key to that actually wrote a book that I still have 
And if you look at this book, it's quite old. This is the first book I had for C programming, which was my profession. So when I went to official training that my company put me through on becoming a C programmer, this book was handed to us and I've had it ever since. And I've, I've actually referenced in quite a bit, even though I have the C++ one, this was the original C, pure C without the plus plus, as they say. So uh, I always have that as something I'd like to, uh, to keep. But Jeremy, tell me, um, actually, how far back does it go when you actually started using Linux? It was, I, I can't pinpoint the exact year. I'd have to dig a little bit more to find that. But uh, it was either 1997 or 1998. So about 22, 23 years. I know it was about August of the year when I uh, first uh, picked up a book that had like six different Linux uh, CDs, not DVDs, CDs um, uh, attached to the covers. So, <laughs> This particular one is one of the things I mentioned on my last video on your channel. Because mm -hmm. I already, uh, he, uh, Jeremy interviewed me on his channel not too long ago. And so there's a couple of videos he has up. We, we took a long time with that one. I hope we don't go that far today. But this particular one, somebody could stop the video and look at it. I have Red Hat Linux 7.0, Mandrate Linux 7.2, SUSE Linux 7.0, Corel Linux 1.2, something called Best Linux, hmm. and then a, the toolbox for a 200R4. That, that, that's part of the CD package, where they give you some additional tools, utilities that any one of these could be used. You had to compile them on it in order to use it. And then this is the one I really, really liked. And this is the one I spent most of the time with. One that's on this particular one. And I'll read them off. It's uh, Mandrate 7.1. And they had extras too. I guess additional software you could compile. They had Storm Linux 2000. They had Slackware 7.1 binaries and Slackware 7.1 source. That's the one that I had the most experience with was Slackware. Mm -hmm. And so these are unopened, shrunk wrap. Huh. I threw away the CDs of the ones with that, that were open when I, when I refurbished my studio here. But anything that was still shrunk wrap, I kept. You never know. Somebody might be interested in, a, in that someday, and I could make a few dollars. I don't know. So I did, I did find a couple of things. So um, this uh, woo, Red Hat, uh, this was on my... Um, this is the publisher's edition. Uh, this was from the, the book that I showed in, in the video we did before. Right. Um, I think that's version, it's either 5.2 or 6.0. And then Mandrake 7, I think I showed this in the other video, and Storm Linux 2000. Oh, so I, had, I have all of those three on these distributions, but older versions in a couple of cases. Yeah, and this came off from a magazine... Um, I believe the magazine was out of the UK uh, called Maximum Linux. And this was the May, June 2000 uh, edition of that magazine. I don't think I've still got the magazine, but I've got the, the, the discs. <laughs> yeah, interesting story about Ubuntu. Um, I started using them, I think, in, in the about 2006. Okay. And at the time... Uh, they actually had a program where they would send out disks to you free of charge. So I've got, I think in the bottom of my file cabinet, I've got some disks that came from Ubuntu. Uh, I think it was the Ubuntu and Kubuntu with the KDE desktop. Okay. Uh, but both, um, you, you know, branded from Canonical uh, and sent out at no cost to me. I'm, well, I may have had to pay shipping. I, I don't, I don't recall at this point, but um, it was, it was a nice little program they had going at the time. Okay. So kind of, kind of interesting footnote in the history there. Well, like I mentioned on your channel, I had a subscription to these disc sets. Mm -hmm. So I think it was every three months I got another one. That's why I have some, I never opened up. Right. Because I had, you know, I didn't, I wasn't much for trying to upgrade any of this because that was a major hassle back then. Oh, yes. Uh, but, you know, I had it just in case I wanted to like load up a new machine with it or 
I did open up one of these intentionally when it had a version of Red Hat on it that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to load that on my work laptop. We needed it. It was for a job that I had with a company that doesn't exist anymore uh, called Nortel out of Canada that I worked for. I was in New York. I was a regional consulting manager for them. I had six people that worked for me. And they bought us really high-end Apple uh, Pro laptop. Nice. These things cost $4,800. <laughs> the most disc, they didn't have solid state disc then. This was, right. this was back in uh, 2004, I would say. 2003, 2004, around that time frame. We set it up so that we could, uh, we loaded in um, the, the, uh, the freeware. No, it wasn't a freeware. We paid for the version of virtualization engine that was being sold. I, I just found the disk to that and I have it saved, but they still sell it. You can get a freeware version now. They didn't offer that then. You had to pay like a, it was a $75 cost for a license. Sure. So my company bought licenses for basically all the consultants in security. They bought these laptops and sent them to everybody. And then they had nice, large hard drives at the time. 500 gig was enormous. Mm -hmm. So we would partition it. We'd put a uh, half of it as regular Windows. And I think it was at the time, believe it or not, Windows XP. And then we would put the other half as Linux. And we left, actually it wasn't half, it was like a, a third, third, and third because we left regular Apple on one third of it. The version of XP we had on there was actually a copy. That particular VM software had, an, had a utility that you could take an existing machine running Windows or any operating system really, and it would create an, uh, a transfer over to our, um, our laptop. And okay. it would transfer the entire partition over and then put it in as a VM. So you then had the exact machine. You had to tweak things, you know, like the network oh, sure. connectors and USBs and stuff like that. But other than that, it worked fine. One thing about Linux, I just want to point out to our listeners here, is there's a lot of different types of utilities you have options to use. You know, Windows has some of that, but nowhere near as a varied choice of different things you can use. For example, just a simple editor, you know, there are many different ones to choose from. Now, when I, in my day, we, I used when I, this is where I learned in school and that's all they taught us was VI. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I did on a, on a, my hobby part of Linux, I went ahead and used Emacs for a while. And then I switched to VI <laughs> because I was, you know, it's not, and not that Emacs was bad. It had a lot of power to it, but maybe a little too much power for me. So what was your, what's your feeling? Which, which there are some newer ones now, right? That you could use as editors. Right. Um, my, my go-to editor at this point um, is Nano. Uh, but, um, you know, when I've taken classes in Linux before, um, my, well, my first, my very first Linux class was taught by, a woman who had actually worked at Bell Labs. So she pushed VI pretty hard. That's the same thing, yeah. That's how I got it too, because the instructor we had for that one professional training course that my company sent me to, and that was years before, that was in the, uh, in the 1980s, where I, they sent me to the C programming class, and that was a two-week long class. And in that one, it was only VI. And that's all we were allowed to use. Oh, wow. Because that's what, that's what the instructor had their lesson plan focused on, but they did sure. mention Emacs. But at the time, the big security flaws had just come out with Emacs. Mm -hmm. So there was a big issue about that in terms of, you know, how you could break into root using Emacs much more easily. Right. So there was a big concern by from the corporate environment, you know, not to use that. Do you use any of the other ones? There are other ones too that are out there, right? Uh, there are, there are several other ones out there there's pico there's um i think there's one called joe um okay. uh that i i've not used that one uh pico is sort of a um i, I don't know if it was a fork technically or if it was a clone of nano um but uh very similar in operation um but you, you know I normally go back and forth between Nano and VI because 
Um, on most modern systems, you'll find both. Um, there are some cases where there are a few bells and whistles in VI that uh, can be very useful, like if you want to jump to a specific line number in a long text file. Um, that uh, uh, can be very useful for configuration files and things of that nature. Okay. Now, one thing that uh, I don't have a lot of experience with, with Linux in particular, and, and actually with Unix somewhat. Now, I, I did work as a developer writing C programs for a large bank in Unix. It was regular Sys5 Unix, though. At the time, uh, the version I mentioned in, in your video was from NCR, which I'm not going to get into my <laughs> discussion about NCR again. And it was uh, a real a real hair, hair puller dealing with them. We had our development workstations that were all these Apollo workstations. They were all highly networked. The Apollo version of Sys5 Unix was very, and it was added to quite a bit by Apollo, which later, it was similar to a Sun workstation at the time. That was their, they were the number one competitor to Sun who had those high-end engineering workstations. Well, these are, were Apollos, they were workstations as well. Apollo was a rather small share of the market compared to Sun. Sun was the big ones. Sun had all of Wall Street at the time. If you went to work for <laughs> a company doing programming on Wall Street, you were working on a Sun workstation. And uh, there's real power in that because that was where they first started putting in all the extras like good debuggers that were graphically oriented. Right. There was a lot of effort that went into that. I mean, the word processing stuff alone was really a document development program. It had mm -hmm. power beyond what I never would have imagined. We actually wrote training manuals with it very easily. So it was a corporate product. They paid a lot of money for it. But we didn't really network other than doing a regular FTP and Telnet to the Unix servers that we had in the branches. And what I mean by that, of course, I was in a development environment, so we had a lab. And in the lab, we would have one or two Unix servers that mimicked, you know, they were from different purposes. One was a development one where we compiled software. Another one was a test box where the software got only tested by our QA department. And we would not let them network together. They really didn't know about each other other than what was in the host file. So if you wanted to send files between them, you had to deal with FTP. We would, also, we would turn off all of the R commands because they were just too insecure. And uh, so you had the Telnet and we had the, the Telnet. Later on, we went to a version of Telnet provided by uh, our vendor that allowed for um, encrypting across the network. So that was a big plus. But we didn't have them networked as you say networked. I mean, I'm not like today where I can actually remote in from my workstation here, my Windows workstation, over to my backup workstation and actually get a window that is the same graphical user interface to it. Even my little box here that I'm turning into my, my backup domain controller running Ubuntu, I can remotely manage this with a nice utility that's provided that allows me to do it in a graphical user interface fashion. That didn't exist in those days, but you know, it's never been something that I saw a lot of in terms of networking a, a raw Unix system. Um, what's your experience in that area in terms, and you, you have some credentials, I think from your undergraduate at least, and you graduate about network, networking of these equipment. Uh, yeah, so my, my undergraduate work was um, uh, a BS in information technology with a concentration in networking. That's what I thought, yeah. And uh, the, uh, the big um, security class, um, well, that's what they called it anyways. It was mostly, um, mostly a Linux and Cisco networking uh, class uh, sort of grouped together um, and a bunch of intertwined projects. And it, it was interesting and terribly frustrating at the same time because it was one of those classes where you had, uh, you, you were graded as a group. Mm -hmm. And um, we had one guy that had 
uh, more Cisco experience. So he sort of handled the networking side of things. And I had the Linux experience. Um, but uh, the, the professor we had was um, really trying to immerse us and, and throw us in the deep end and make us swim. Uh, and so we weren't allowed to use the package managers for the for the uh, installation of software on right. our Linux systems. We had to download the source code and compile it and hand build the uh, configuration files. And um, yeah. it really, it really changes your outlook on things. And um, you, you know, that was 2006 ish. Um, I think it was fall of 2006. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't have a separate uh, uh, compiling and testing setup. We had a couple of machines and um, we had a, a diagram that we had to model our network after and make things work the way the, the diagram was laid out. And uh, we, Pulled it off by the end of the semester, but it was it was a lot of late nights in the lab and a lot of reading and frantically asking questions and you know trying to track down people that had just a little bit more knowledge than we did. Yeah, um, that's the way this works sometimes. Yeah. So, but it makes you appreciate how easy things are now. So I, I noticed the same thing. You know, and I think back to how we did it back then in the 80s. The Linux has constantly been growing over many years, and it, it, it's public. I mean, that's one thing I think a lot of people don't realize about it. It's, it's open. It's mm -hmm. hard for somebody to put a real bug in there because it will usually get caught by somebody. Everybody has access to the source code. You know, that's a big plus, you know, whereas Microsoft, they sort, of, they sort of keep it to themselves. Mm -hmm. And I saw that culture firsthand because when I was a consultant for one of the consulting firms I worked for uh, at the time, Coopers and Librarian, which later became PricewaterhouseCoopers, we did a big job for Microsoft. I had to actually go out to Redmond, Washington. I saw the three buildings they had, which was their headquarters. And it was an amazing thing because they had a, a, a management building, executive building in the middle. And it was set up sort of like a, an arrowhead, you know, with the main one here and then the one back here and another one back here. So it was like one here, one here, one here. They were pretty big and they were on stilts. Hmm. The parking was underneath them, which I'm sure they had to change that ever since 9-11. Right. Because you could park a truck underneath there. They were tall stilts. And the stilts themselves were actually staircases into the building. Wow. So, and we did, we at first, so me and my, my boss and a couple of other people at my level went there to, to actually, when they, we got hired for this job, we had to go and present what we were going to do. And I won't get into that too much right now because that's a, we helped them do a white paper and a product that doesn't exist anymore, but we learned, got to learn their culture. They had one building that was the executive building. The other building was their windows building. And then over on the other side was their at the time, Windows NT system building, mm. you know, which later, later became, eventually they merged them together, you know, because now there's only one, but there was, when it came to the more sophisticated operating system like ones was Windows NT, they didn't talk to the Windows people. Our buyer there, a, a senior manager that was the one interfacing with us. It was amazing the stories he told. I don't have a non-disclosure agreement with them anymore. It's already expired. So we're talking about a long time ago, just to let, it know, let everybody know in case they're watching this. So, you know, but and I'm sure it's changed since then, be, but it was an amazing thing to see uh, how they were organized. And, and that's what people don't realize that they are very secretive. They were secretive amongst themselves. They, if you were in the windows uh, building, if they saw a windows NT box on somebody's, shelf in their cubicles, they would get called in and spoken to. They didn't want the uh, one, one did not want the other half to know what they were doing. Oh. And then the story about Easter eggs. I don't know if you ever dealt with an Easter egg on something before. Oh, yes. According to our, our, our the manager, that was an official no, no policy at Microsoft. 
He goes, but every time there's a new release, there's a new Easter egg that was put in there by their own teams. Right. And it was a big thing about them at the coffee clutch talking about the latest Easter egg that was in there and the sequence that you had to go through with the keystrokes to get suddenly a list of all the developers fly by on on the screen. I could not have been more surprised by that, by a company that big, even then um, to, you know, this was what, 1995, 1995. Even then to see them, you know, doing things like that. Anyway, I wanted to uh, get into, um, and that's where I was leading. I'm sorry I went off into a tangent here. But how do you keep up? How do you keep up with the latest? Is it just, uh, you know, visiting all sorts of different websites? Or do you have some other fixed source of your information on, you know, keeping up with what Linux is doing? So I have, I have a handful of websites that I visit. Um, I used to do it every day, but... Uh, you know, middle age is catching up with me. So uh, um, it, it's maybe three times a week now. Um, but uh, some of these sites I've been visiting for almost 20 years. Wow. <laughs> um, um, I also um, have a very lengthy list of YouTubers I follow. Okay. And so, you know, you know, there are things that are out a little bit outside of my wheelhouse of expertise. And so, you know, I will um, watch a video and, you know, try to get up to speed on some of the newer technologies and, and concepts. Uh, most recently I was watching a video on edge computing and fog computing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you, you know, um, with, with uh, the IOT stuff, this is all getting interesting again. Um, uh, but and it, just uh, to, for our listeners, IOT is the uh, internet of the things, right? internet of things. That's how our refrigerator is maybe connected to the internet. And That's they right. may tell you through email or what other connection or app telling you what it needs. Yes. That's and, the future of that. And, and for the love of Pete, please, please segment those devices off. <laughs> you know, they're from- not from anything of value on your network. Um, (laughs) You know they're not, though. You know that. It's going to be scary when you can hack a refrigerator (laughs) and and take over somebody's network. And (laughs) it's just a matter of time. Yeah, I know. Before that story hits the headlines. I know. And and just think about it, right? The, uh, The idea that it's more economical for your refrigerator vendor when they get to that point to be able to, if, if you have a warranty on it or you mm-hmm. have an extended warranty, it's more efficient for them to connect directly to it to get the status. And so you're going to say, fine, that'll make my refrigerator work better. Who's right. going to ask about security? Not many people even right. know that there's an issue there. And you, so you'll have somebody coming in. You, if they, they may even tell you, go to your router and they'll, ex, they'll give you instructions on how to go into your, into your router and open up what they call a port mm-hmm. so that they can connect right to the refrigerator. And that's great. You'll do it. I'm not going to say I'm going to do it. I don't <laughs> let any ports through my network. But the average person, they'll see that as a benefit. They'll allow it. And that's when I was a security, uh, you know, we were talking about my profession. Right now I'm compliance, but I used to be doing security reviews of all sorts of companies. Mm -hmm. That's why Microsoft hired us to help them write a white paper about a security product they were selling. They wanted to have outside organizations like us do an evaluation of it. They paid us a lot of money for that too. It's not like the evaluations you see today where, you know, get the YouTubers doing it for free. (laughs) <laughs> you know, matter of fact, you tend to not see that too much about security products anyway. Right. Because nobody wants to open up the insides of it without full non-disclosure of every little thing. But anyway, that aside, people don't understand, you know, what they're, at, what they're doing with this. And I don't blame them. It's something that when we come to what's called opening up a port, that's called punching a hole through your firewall. Mm-hmm. Just keep that in mind, anybody who's listening to this. I used to do reviews of firewalls for companies. And early on, the co- firewalls were atrocious. With very large companies, I, I probably am not legally uh, bound not to say who they are because it's way past any non-disclosure agreement I had. But I still don't feel comfortable doing that. So I won't. But we always knew when we went in, 
And some of them were big companies you it would frighten people to know. We would go in, they would hire us to do a review of their firewall. And the first question, and this was during even the pre-sale, even when we hadn't sold the engagement, we're competing with somebody. The first question I would ask is, how long has that firewall been in place for you? The second question would be, which firewall is it? What version do you have? But those were easy to change. Mm -hmm. I was more concerned because most of these companies, and one in particular, which I won't even tell you what the industry is, it'll scare people. (laughs) They... um, they, they called us in to give them a quote on doing a firewall review. And it was like, even before we, we didn't have to sell them. I remember sitting with the CIO and uh, this person said, yeah, well, we, uh, we do a firewall review every year. And every year we use a different company. And we were looking at the ones who have the good ratings out there. And Coopers and Librarian has a good rating for doing this. So we'd like to, I mean, we didn't have to sell it. She said, we'd like to hire you for this, you know, assuming your price is within our range. So what would you charge? What would be your range of charges for doing that? And I said, well, the range is anywhere from like $15,000. Now we're talking about like 1999, okay? Mm -hmm. All the way up to about $50,000, depending on what your configuration is, how many actual machines we'd have to look at. And, and how they're configured and what sort of business you do with them. We may have to look at applications. We may have to look at other backend service. We may have to look at a lot of things. So we have to scope it out. She, this person goes, well, I'm only interested in the firewall itself. I want you to do uh, what you know, other vendors have done in previous years. They've just done an external attack and penetration, white, the white hat hacking. And they came up with a report looking for that from you. What would you charge for that? And I remember my boss was about to immediately spit it out because our, our, our price was closer to 25000 for that. And I stopped him. I raised my hand I, and uh, I said, well, I'd like to ask you a question first, a couple of questions. How many years have you been doing this? And this person goes, uh, this would be our fifth year. And I said, so your firewall has been in place for five years. The person goes, yes. The same firewall, same version. Do you know if it's been upgraded? We had it upgraded once to a newer version of the exact same firewall. Now, this was running um, a commercial firewall that I was very familiar with. And I knew all the versions. And uh, so this person spit the version out to me and said, okay, but it's been running that version. And when you did the upgrade, they didn't have to change anything with your applications, right? Oh, no, absolutely not. That was a requirement. So realistically, it's been running five years. Has anybody found anything wrong with your firewall when they did these external attack and penetrations? Uh, Well, no, we've always gotten a clean report. I said, okay, I'll say two things. And I turned to my boss, I said, uh, you know, give me a a moment here. You know, my boss trusted me at this one because I was the tech person, he wasn't. And I said, I'll tell you two things. First of all, we could do this for you. Our chances of finding something wrong, doing just external penetration, white hat hacking is less than 5%, especially knowing that you've probably got the basics covered for sure if nobody's found anything. But what I will also say is it's probably, and I could, I, I could show you the formula I use for this. I have it right here as we were talking, I wrote it down. <laughs> I said, you have a 50% chance of having a serious vulnerability in your firewall right now. But you just said you only have a 5% chance. I said, because if you limit us to just testing from the outside, we're not going to find everything. I had this actual slide. I used to do presentations at industry groups. I used to create, I created this slide. It was a bed of pebbles. And I said, you have a a pot of water and you're going to do a stream of water from the top to the bottom. If I do an attack and penetration, all I'm going to do is find two or three stream paths through it. If I find it at all, I may hit a block. I may hit something that absorbs the water along the way. But if I picked one, one inch over, it wouldn't absorb it. It'd go right through. So that's an analogy I used. So if we just do attack and penetration, it's me trying so many streams I could do in whatever time we do. Our standard firewall attack and penetration only is one week. I can't find everything in one week. Well, I don't know. That doesn't sound right. You know, I said, well, you know, we'll, we could do a real review for you for about the same amount of money. Of course, my, I'm getting like kicked in the foot by my boss. <laughs> He's thinking he should want to charge more, right? And I, and I, but I was realistically, that in terms of hours, it would be the same. And he, he goes, and then, well, how is that possible? I said, because I won't do an attack and penetration. I will bring in an expert on that version of, they were running BSD, 
Linux, a BSD Unix, I forget which version it was, and they were running uh, the checkpoint firewall. Okay. And I said, I'll bring in a person, maybe two people, depending on you know who's available, one for each, one for the operating system and one for the checkpoint firewall. And they will look on what I call the inside out review. They will look at the configuration in detail from the inside as an administrator. And they will tell you what's possibly going to fail. Well, the long and short of it was, she bought it, brought us, brought us in. And I, you know, part of every engagement we did, if we find something that seems critical, I will immediately give a call to them and let them know. Otherwise, they will get our status report about midway, about Wednesday of the week, because we start Monday morning. And then we'll come in the following Monday and give them the closing presentation. I get, I'm there. I, I know that my two experts are there. Uh, one was really on Windows. I didn't need a, a Unix and a Checkpoint one because that was the same person who happened to be available. My peer, another senior person. It was like about 9.30 in the morning and the, the engagement started at 9 o'clock. And uh, John was his name. John, I picked up the phone. I saw his, his call coming in from his cell phone. John, what's the matter? Are you having problems getting in? He goes, oh, no, I'm in. I've been working here an hour now. I said, okay, is everything okay? Any access? No, I, I just have something I have to report to you. <laughs> and I said, what's that? He goes, you're not going to believe this. But I found that uh, in their cron tab, which for those of you watching who are not familiar with that, that's a, a special function that uh, Unix has that allows you to time certain types of programs to run. So you could set it up, mostly it's used for backups. You decide that you wanna do your backups during a weekend or uh, uh, during the night. You don't wanna interfere with people working on the machine. So you set it up to do a, a backup script or a program to back everything up. And you put that in the cron tab. In the cron tab, you put the day, the time, and all of the details about uh, which program to run and it runs it, you know, I'm obviously making, simpli making it simple here in this description, but that's what it is. I said, what did you find in CronTab? He goes, well, I found two things. One, I know exactly what it is, and the other one I'm still investigating. And I said, what's the thing, the, what, are they both bad? He goes, potentially both bad. And I said, well, what's the one you know? He goes, we found an entry that every March 28th, recurring, and because you set up recurring, you could have it do it over and over again, the system does an init zero, which is a command in, in Unix to shut down. I said, what? Are you sure it says init zero? It's not even an init one, which would be a restart, because I've seen that. No, no, init zero. And so I said, that, that's weird. So I immediately got on the phone and called my contact, and I told them what, what we found, that it, this, it looks to us like the machine has been programmed to shut itself down every March 28th. And I think we even had the time. The time was like at uh, six o'clock at night. Now I knew their hours were more than that. But, you know, maybe the person who put it in, they didn't realize that. But we couldn't figure out what it was. I said, can you at least check any of your, your uh, cause this person was a CIO, they controlled the help desk too. Did you have any tickets that came out on March 29th or March 28th, whatever it was, uh, where the machine had to be, you know, rebooted? Oh, I'll go check. And it took her a while to come back. <laughs> but she said, you know, the, uh, yeah, um, we see it for the last two years. <laughs> Every March 28th at six o'clock, because I didn't tell her the time. The, the, they got, a call comes in that the server's unavailable and we have to send somebody in there to reboot it. And she goes, what? That was in there? Programmed that way? And I said, yeah, in the cron tab. She didn't know Unix. I explained to her just like I did here what it is. And she goes, why would somebody do that? I said, well, do you, did your employees install this? Well, no, I think I indicated that we had it installed by somebody else. I said, yeah, but that was like five years ago, right? She goes, no, well, we kept him on board as a consultant for maintenance on an ongoing basis. And I said, maintenance, and uh, are they available? Are they still for maintenance? No, we dropped that contract, you know, about a year ago. I said, really? How do you maintain it now? Well, we have somebody we sent to Unix training, and they never saw this. Well, they don't normally get it to that level, she goes. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll tell you something. That's a bad one. And, and she asked, why would they do it? And I said, the only thing I could think of, and I remember seeing an init one, which means restarted. At the time, Linux was a little buggy, just like Windows, certain versions of it. It was Unix, I'm sorry, not Linux. And the way you prevented it from eventually getting a memory leak that led to a crash is you'd reboot it so every so often. And that would clear memory, start the whole thing over again, and it would be nice, freshly running. Because that's a big thing. I can tell you as a developer, memory leaks in your program. Big thing. 
any one program that runs at a high privilege that is allocating memory, requesting a small little memory piece, but eventually you request enough of it, it first fragments your memory and then it exhausts your memory. And the system will usually have some serious problem on that when that happens, right? And the way you avoid it, very common, you'd restart it every so often. And using CronTab for it, I said, was a very common thing. Although we tried not to get people to do that, we'd recommend not. Because if you have a program that's bad in there, maybe you can get a newer version of it and fix the problem. You should trace what the program is that did it. You have ways of doing that. So uh, anyway, she, she said, oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I didn't think I did. you guys would find anything, especially this quick. And I said, and we're working on another one. She goes, another one? What is that one? I said, I really don't know at this moment. I just know that John is working on another one. And so uh, she goes, oh, please let me know what the other problem is. I mean, I'll tell you, it wasn't even lunchtime and John called me again. And he, this one took about you know, a couple of hours for him to figure out. Somebody, I mean, this was a really bad one. Somebody put, he started in CronTab again, which is what he said. Somebody put a program link that, it, that would run every Wednesday morning at 2.05 in the morning that ran a program with this obscure name to it. And it was running as a privileged user as root. It was an actually SU'd program. And so that's the first thing that scared him. So he traced it. He couldn't figure out what this program is. He did searches. He went on. At the time, there wasn't as much information on the internet about these types of things as there is now, but he did the best he could. And then finally, what he did is he traced out the name and he found that somebody had it as a hidden file. And then he found a whole hidden directory. You just put a oh, dot no. in front of the name and you hide it. It was a clear back door. I mean, as obvious as they can be. And what it was doing was running a version of the FTP server from Wollongong, the freeware version. They had taken it, right. they downloaded it, they compiled it after editing it. What they did is they modified this program, this uh, FTP server with no authentication on it. It was a default one, no authentication. It would run for five minutes and then kill itself. It ran a timer and when the timer timed out, it would kill itself. So we'd live from 2.05 in the morning to 2.10 in the morning, every Wednesday morning. And like I called up and I said, you got a back door in there. I told our, our buyer and, and she couldn't believe it. She was like, how, what would, I said, well, I'll tell you, somebody had to have a lot of access to this system. It, you know, I, it could be a hacker broke in, but I don't think so. I think this feels to me like something um, a person that you hired to maintain it might do. Because she told me that this person wasn't in New York. Actually, this system was in New Jersey. She goes, you know, they lived out in Ohio somewhere. That was their position. But they were being paid to keep the machine running. So they would call up this guy in Ohio and he would help them remotely, usually working with their um, Unix person they were trying to train. Well, he set himself a little protection there is what he did. Not protection against his contract or job. I didn't believe that. But in case he found out that he had, because he had some custom software and stuff, mostly scripts in there that he had put in there to make it easier for them to do things. And I think that uh, he wanted to have the ability to change one of those scripts if there was a problem, because it was a real challenge to try to send them a new version of something. Sure. So this way he could go in there and the fact that it was FTP indicated that he would FTP it in there and then he didn't have to send them anything. And then we got a conference call with the person who this guy had worked with when he was still working. And he said, oh yeah, he used to call me up and have me run these commands. I said, did you write any of them down? And sure enough, he had written them down. And the guy went to run some obscure program, usually a script, and he didn't know what it was. And that wasn't in, in the normal distribution for BSD Unix. <laughs> so that means that he had downloaded it probably the previous Wednesday. And that way he could call them up and fix a problem. So I don't think there was any malicious intent on that one, but clearly, I mean, I still remember I, right after lunch, I get a call back from my buyer and she goes, you know, David, I never thought I would say this, but you more than earned the fees for this engagement already. <laughs> now as a consultant, you want to hear that. Believe me, you Absolutely. want to hear that. Absolutely. And and it really paid off. We, uh, we, she kept hiring us for other work after that, including like rewriting all her security policies. I mean, we, we made a couple of million dollars out of that account over a period of a, about a year and a half. That was a lot of money in those days to make from one account. Oh, yeah. You know, you know it was like halfway to the money I needed to become a partner. I didn't become a partner with uh, <laughs> PricewaterhouseCoopers <laughs> because the merger sort of derailed that one. Coopers and sure. Librand. I was on the partner track with Coopers and Librand. 
Then they merged with Price Waterhouse. And once it became Price Waterhouse Coopers, all bets were off. If you weren't on the political side of something, you got nowhere. Anyway, sorry about talking uh, forever, but that was one of those things that really, you know, tells a story in terms of trying to keep up with this. John was my Unix expert, right? I knew it well, but he knew it better. I mean, that's what he did. And uh, he, um, he was top notch in both networks and, and, uh, and Unix. Uh, he's, you know, he's a good 15 years younger than me. He's more like your age. Sure, sure. You know, in terms of this, but he's a good, he really knows his stuff. And uh, that was an important thing. But a lot of times, if I had a question, this was an important thing. The reason I wanted to say that you mentioned, sometimes you had to go reach out to somebody else. I had two people I'd reach out to. I'd reach out to John first, because we worked for the same organization. Mm -hmm. But second to that, I'd reach out for this consultant that I still keep in touch with. This guy used to work for me when I was a development manager. He is off the scale in knowledge on Unix, absolutely off the scale. And uh, I just, you know, I could go on and on about that. That's all he does. Right. You know, he, he's, he's here. You were sort of remind me of him. You know, that's what he does. If you looked at his house and I visited there once, he has servers all over. He had to put an extension on his house just for all of the <laughs> junk that he had. I call it junk. He calls it potentially useful equipment. Right. But he has stuff that is much older and much more of it than I could ever have. And if you have a question about Unix or any version of it, Linux, Unix, whatever. You call him up and he, he knows it. I don't know if you do consulting on the side or anything, but have you ever been involved in a, an investigation in terms of trying to find something? Uh, I have unofficially been involved in a couple of things. Uh, I A few years ago, I did some work with a, a security guy by the name of Joe McRae. And um, he had a uh, vision for building up some uh, training materials and he enlisted um, people that were interested in security and wanted to get some hands-on training. Um, so I worked more on the side of the um, editing the videos that others would record, mm -hmm. um, but also testing out some of the the written materials, um, and um, mm -hmm. he had some opportunities for some of the some of the people. Um, it it didn't work real well with my schedule when it happened, but uh, uh, for some red team engagement uh, type uh, right. work. Um, so it it was it was really interesting, and you, you know. Um, uh, his his uh, group, I believe the the group was called the Rookies Project, um, and uh, he has built up. Uh, and I believe his company is called Strategic Security, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, but, there's a lot of them that have popped up over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them really good. Some of them, yeah, you know, question. Uh, but Joe has done work with, with the government for, for things, uh, the U S government. So, uh, he's, he's presented at DEF CON and, and just, uh, a good guy to know. And, um, you talk to him and you're always going to learn something. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, uh, that's an important source to have that. Like I said, even today, uh, if I had a question about something really deep into Unix, I would call that, that other consultant again. He's a professional engineer like I am. He had, he was a professional engineer though, 20 years before I was. Wow. Uh, in, in, in computers, in computer engineering. Most people don't realize, you know, the way that professional engineering thing works. The whole, uh, there are like 22 different disciplines you could become an engineer in. Mm -hmm. There were three of them dedicated to the electrical engineering category. And within that category, I don't know if I said this on your channel or not, I forget. But the three of them are um, regular electronics and electronics being like the people who build communication transmitters, general mm -hmm. purpose electronic equipment. You know, in the old day, the ones who built the, the radios and TVs, even today, the newer equipment like that. But the not, anything that's not computer based. Sure. For example, that includes, you know, like I said, transmitters mostly for uh, radio stations, television stations of that nature. And there's a big component to that that's not computer based. There's pieces of it that get 
controlled by computers, but there's actual components they have to build with what they call discrete circuits. Mm -hmm. That's one category. The other category are the high power electrical category. That's the ones that deal mostly with the power companies. So the ones that create the transmission lines, the ones that create the generation, the large generators, or even small generators, anybody that makes a generator to uh, be sold to the public or to be used for public purposes, like, you know, generating their power, you know, usually you have to have a power a power engineer dealing with that. And then the third one is what I did, computer engineering. And that's the ones who deal, and it's an interesting one because it actually has three sub-disciplines to it. The test I took, and there's two tests to it, but I, the part two focused on just computer engineering. It had 40% electrical engineering, general electronics, transistor circuits, and, you know, um, multi-vibrators and all gates and everything else, the standard flip-flops and stuff like that. Another... Um, 40% on software, not like general purpose writing a web application. It's a software where you're actually, what I used to do, which was developing system type software and developing firmware, which I also did in a previous job. So that type of low level software, it's still software. They call it firmware in the case of something that's in a ROM or a BIOS for your PC, but it's still software. And then there's, uh, so that was 40% as well in just general programming. And obviously they couldn't, they didn't focus on any one language. So they gave you algorithms that were algorithmic based, that were generic. And to make sure you understood, understood how loops worked and things like that. And then the third thing is 20%, which apparently was only added probably the last 10 or 15 years ago, which is uh, computer security. I didn't even have to study for that. The computer <laughs> security, now computer security itself is broken into many sub-disciplines. You know, you have the system security, you have the network security, you have the organizational security, and there were questions on all of that. And, uh, you know, that was to me, I had been, like you, like you noted, I have a CISSP. I've had that for coming on 20 years now that I've had that. And uh, so I didn't have to study that part at all in order to earn my PE. But I didn't earn my PE until just a little over two years ago. 